latest voice installment of my dad listens to this. I'm Juliet the daughter. That must make me, as always, Kevin the dad. And as Juliet, always. tell the folks at home what album you picked for this podcast. All right, this week I picked The Glamorous Life, or Is It, by Sheila E. So, Dad, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila Cecilia Escovito was born December 12, 1957, in Oakland, California. She comes from a very musical family. Her father, Pete, and Uncle Coke, both did stints in Santana in the 70s. Oh, that explains why she played for Carlos at the Kennedy Center Honors. Mm-hmm. Her other uncles, Javier, Mario, and Alejandro, are also musicians and have been in various bands. And her godfather was Tito Puente, the, <gasps> the king of the timbales, and a guest star on the two-part Simpsons episode, Who Shot Mr. Burns? Really? Why was he on? I have no idea, but it makes sense when you watch it. Oh, okay. Now, when she was three years old, she developed a love for playing various musical instruments, feeling the most connected to the drums and other percussion instruments. At the age of five, Sheila gave her first public performance for an audience of 3,000 appearing alongside her dad. It was while on that stage playing a drum solo that Sheila first realized she was going to be a percussionist. Mm -hmm. She made her recording debut at the age of 19 with jazz bassist Alfonso Johnson. By her early 20s, she had played with George Duke, Lionel Richie, Herbie (gasps) Hancock, Diana Ross, and Marvin Gaye. Holy shit. Yeah. In 1977, she joined the George Duke Band and played congas and percussion on four of their albums. In 1978, she met Prince while she was performing with her father. Mm -hmm. Prince said that one day she would join his band, which happened in 1984. Yes. She sang vocals on the B-side to Let's Go Crazy, a song called Erotic City. Mm -hmm. Also in 1984, she released her first album, The Glamorous Life. But to me, it's it's six songs, and it's like a little more than half an hour, so I've always kind of looked at it as an, an EP. EP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, the title track hit number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 Ooh. and number one on the dance charts. The video got three MTV nominations, and Sheila earned two Grammy noms. Mm-hmm. The second single, The Bell of St. Mark, made it to number 34. Mm-hmm. She was the opening act on Prince's Purple Rain tour. Nice. And she and he had a brief romantic relationship. Yep, they did. Whilst his purpleness was also seeing Susanna Melvoin, Wendy's twin sister. Oh, shit. He's a busy guy. They, I'm, I'm going to assume they didn't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oy. And they were also briefly engaged during Prince's love sexy tour. Oh, yeah, they were for a bit. And they, who broke it off? Was it her or him? Don't know, really. Oh, okay. Um, in 1985, Sheila released Romance 1600. The first single, Sister Fate, made it only to number 36, but the second single, an edit of the 12-minute A Love Bazaar, made it to number 11. Sheila E. also in 1985 performed in the movie Crush Groove with Run DMC, which huh. is referenced in the movie Dogma. Oh, really? When? Yes. Um, it's... Matt Damon's angel character. I can't remember the. I can't remember his name. Yeah, uh, but, Loki. Yeah, he talks about how he thought Crush Groove was going to be a bigger movie than some other movie, and he actually starts singing uh, from one of the songs, "Run's House." Whose house? Oh yeah, Run's, Run's house. house. Yeah, right, I remember right. that. So if you watch that movie again, it'll it'll make more sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um, from 1987 through 1989, she was Prince's musical director, playing drums on the Love Sexy Tour. And I think she may have opened for him when I saw him in concert at the Worcester Centrum back in 1989. Cool. I know she was definitely on stage. And she used to do this thing where she would have some audience member come up and attempt to play the timbales. Imagine she brought you up there. <laughs> and you'd be like, I'm ready. I'm yep, ready. Yep, yeah, yep, go, yep, for yep, go for yep, it. Go for it. <laughs> but she would she would also like try and get a little uh, double entendre asking the person, "Would you like to play with my tambales?" And be like, "Yeah, yeah, just just step aside, please." <laughs> um, she, I know she definitely played drums during his set, uh-huh. and if, I wish I still had the Sheila E. T-shirt from that concert because the cool thing about it was all of those letters were reversed. Ooh. So when you looked at it in the mirror, it you was... could actually read everything that it said on the shirt. What happened to that shirt? I don't know. I'm sure I donated it. Because if I saved every single T-shirt that I ever bought, we'd have to get a bigger house. <laughs> or a bigger closet at any rate. Yeah. Um, her third and last album on Paisley Park was called Sheila E. 
and I haven't heard anything from that album, but it's got a great cover. Mm -hmm. uh, a great cover in terms of what? Boobs? They're covered. <laughs> Moving on. Nice mid-riffage, though. Oh, um, God. <laughs> her next album was also for Warner Brothers, but not on the Paisley label. It was called Sex Symbol, like the instrument C-Y-M-B-A-L as opposed to oh, S-Y-M-B-O-L. Cool. I like that. And again, didn't hear anything from the album, but nice cover. Um, she went on tour in Japan, but when she came back, she was hospitalized with a collapsed lung Ooh. and was left semi-paralyzed <gasps> from playing drums in high heels ah. for long periods of time over many years. Ooh. And unfortunately, this kept her out of the public eye for quite a few years, uh -huh. and so she wasn't able to really promote her last major label album. Oof. But yeah, I just cannot imagine playing playing drums in anything but but Sneakers. flat shoes because yeah. you've got that bass pedal that you've got to play mm -hmm. and just to have your foot like bent like that. Mm. Oh. I don't want to think about it. I give her a, a lot I give her a crap load of credit for being able to play like that. God knows what the pain must have been like. So how come she didn't make it onto your best drummer list? Because she just didn't. Okay? No. <laughs> you say you respect her for playing in heels, so doesn't that give I her do, some I do. merit? <laughs> you know, I could only fit ten people on that list. All right. Okay? <laughs> uh, you. Okay. In 1994, she was back playing on Gloria Stefan's Mi Tierra album, mm -hmm. which was one of the most successful Latin music albums ever. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you know that, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's Gloria Estefan, so... Yeah, because um, she wanted to um, do a um, Spanish-language album, and it mm -hmm. just blew up. It just sold and sold and sold and sold. Mm -hmm. Now, Sheila E. keeps on keeping on. She was the house She was the house band leader for Magic Johnson's talk show. Oh, that... In the late 80s, early 90s. It didn't last too long. I was about to say. Yeah. She okay. Now calm down. She also did three stints in Ringo's All Star Band. Oh, cool! Good on Ringo for getting her. Two thousand one, two thousand three, and two thousand six. And Sheila said that um, she and Ringo they would both come out and play drums together. Like she would do one thing, mm -hmm. then he would follow her. Then she would do another thing. He would follow it, and then she just went nuts. And he just looks at her, throws the sticks up in the air, and walks off the stage and lets her do a drum solo. I give up! <laughs> yeah, but she, you know, she said he was a really good sport. You know, they did it in fun, and that he's an amazing drummer, mm -hmm. which he is for keeping time. The guy is just rock steady. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, she also played with Prince in Vegas for a one-night show in 2003, and then played with him again in 2006 for the Brit Awards, which I think is England's version of the Grammys. Grammys, okay. In 2006, she formed the group Co-Ed, Chronicles of Every Diva, huh. with Kat Dyson, Rhonda Smith, and Cassandra O'Neill, all who had played for Prince at one time or another. Oh, cool. In 2009, she co-founded Elevate o Oakland, which uses music and art to serve the needs of kids in Oakland public schools. Nice. In 2016, she played drums on the orchestral soundtracks for Man of Steel <gasps> and Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Oh, cool. Yep. And... In January 20, you know, back when things were still good, yeah. she was the music director for a Grammy salute to Prince at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Aww. And as recently as July 2020, she teaches drums and percussion on the Masterclass website. Oh, yeah. And if you go on that website, you can check out the one-minute sample of her class. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting site. I guess you pay like a monthly fee, mm -hmm. and you can get classes from like... Natalie Portman on acting. Yeah. There's also one with Samuel Jackson. I didn't see what the title was, but yeah. it's probably How to Swear Effectively in Movies. Yeah. Um, There's one with Margaret Atwood for writing. I see the ads all yeah, the time. Yeah, they've got all different... Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, yeah, they've got all mm -hmm. all different arts. So, you know, definitely check that out. Mm. Some people have mixed reviews of it, though. They say some classes are good, but some other classes, it's like celebrities trying to promote their brand. Yeah, I, I suppose. Like, like... The minute sample I, show, I saw from Sheila was very instructive, just how to do this simple conga beat. Mm -hmm. And, like, she really breaks it down, walks you through it, and then puts it all together. Mm -hmm. And it was very impressive. I saw someone else, like, do a master class on how to play the ukulele. And it could 
give you a lot of improvement. More of the story, don't get Quincy Jones on there about how to be a producer in the music business. Why, does he have a master class on there? No, but if he did, he'd spend too much time talking about himself. Yeah, he probably would. Sorry, Quincy, but it's true. Anyway, <laughs> now, as for me, I heard the glamorous life and just went out and bought the vinyl, which I still have, and then, of course, eventually the CD, which I also still have. And the thing is, both of those items go for crazy triple dollar amounts on Amazon, yeah. I guess because they're both out of print. Yeah. Now, I did buy Romance 1600 when it came out on vinyl, and it was okay. I thought it suffered from second albumitis, where, like, you know, for that first album, you have your whole life to make that first album. Mm -hmm. With the second album, you have, like, six months. Yeah. And it comes off as, like, trying too hard, and there's, like, an overly busy sound. And besides A Love Bazaar, there's nothing that really grabs me. Out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, I don't have the album anymore, but I think I might have made a cassette copy, which is probably with all Somewhere. my cassettes on the shelf. Yeah. Because remember, this was the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, now, Prince, also known as the Star Company mm -hmm. on this album, uh, produced the album. And I'm assuming Sheila E. had some input because she also gets a director's credit. Mm -hmm. um, Prince also wrote The Bell of St. Mark. Yep. In the glamorous life, mm -hmm. and co-wrote Noonan Noon Rendezvous. Which... Noonan, oh Noon my Noon, God, Noon, Noon. Noon. Oh, man. He, he co-wrote Noon Rendezvous with Sheila E. And Sheila wrote or co-wrote the other three songs on the album. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into this, shall we? All right. But how'd you first find out about Sheila E. Though? Uh just from hearing the song. Okay. All right. First song, "The Bell of Saint Mark." The opening with those bells tolling is so reminiscent of Hell's Bells, but with a bit of a sugar-coated tinge to it. I've never heard the adjective bell applied to a man before, because in French the equivalent would be beau, but hey, we're in America, so screw the rules of French grammar. The, so the song's story is that Sheila sees this very fragile man who's had his heart broken and is a very fragile being spending most of his time feeding the pigeons. The fact that he's so vulnerable and handsome makes Sheila fall for him, and she wants him to know that she loves him and won't break his heart like that other woman. However, I believe she wouldn't have these feelings towards him if he hadn't gotten his heart broken in the first place. Otherwise, Sheila wouldn't have such an intense desire to take care of him. So she's a sucker for a bird with a broken wing. Yeah. As for the music, it's fine. Like Paul Abdul, but not quite. I mean, you can definitely hear the influence of Prince in this music, but I don't know. If... Oh, yeah, he's all over the place. Yeah, and this this was around the time the two of them were seeing one another, so it makes sense. So, so far, her music hasn't kicked in for me yet, but I, as I wrote in my notes, I think it can get better from here, but it kind of didn't. <laughs> I didn't want it to be that way! I wanted to like this! All right. Um, yeah, to me, the opening bow bells kind of give the song uh, uh, Notre, a Notre Dame, Where in France vibe. Okay. Because the whole Bell of St. Mark thing. And then electric, pro electric percussion comes in that kind of sounds like clockworks. I don't know if there's like a oh. bell, like a, there's not a clock tower in the in Notre Dame, is there? I'm not sure. I've never been. Okay. Yeah, well, that's the impression I got. To me, it kind of sounds like clockworks. And then the squiggly keyboard comes in and stays for the whole song. Mm -hmm. Now, since Prince wrote it, I'm assuming that Sheila changed all the male pronouns to female. Yeah. But there is that question of why still call it the bell instead of the bow? The bow? For me, it just sounds better. I mean, the yeah. bow of St. Mark just sounds too jarring to the air. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to let the rules of French grammar slide. Slide just this once. Yeah. But if you were in French school, if you were taking French in the EP, oh, God forbid you'd, you'd get, get your marks F. taken off. Yeah, you'd get an F. And not an F of French. And anyway, yeah, Sheila's just aching for the bell who has this broken heart that will not heal. And at the end, when she says if he doesn't love her, she'd die, it's like you totally believe it. She's like out of breath and mm -hmm. like, okay, she needs life support now. But, yeah, I think you bring up a good point that if this guy... You it's know, just a regular Joe. Yeah. Yeah, she's and, thing. yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely Prince-dominated. And, like, she doesn't get a chance to show off her percussive skills yet. Yeah, yet. Catchy tune, though. Yeah. All right, next, next song, Shortberry Straw Cake. Yes, you heard that right. Not Strawberry Shortcake, Shortberry Straw Cake. So I heard that panting at the beginning, and I got scared because it sounded like Sheila was having some sort of seizure or experiencing a severe <laughs> medical attack. I was like, screw the cake, get her to a hospital! I came to the conclusion that this song was just someone turning on a microphone while Sheila and Prince were jamming in the studio, and then the two of them decided, hey, maybe there's a song here. It definitely has the improvisational feel of jazz to it. 
I thought it was cool how the guitar sounded like the angry yowls of a cat at the beginning, and then you hear Prince's distorted voice being piped in and intertwining with the guitar. Yet you can't make out what he's saying, if there are any lyrics at all. The only thing I got out of the song was the percussion, because there's that steady beat of the electric drum that's right at the center of your head, if you listen mm -hmm. to it on headphones, mixed in with some cowbell in the background. I mean, I know she is a fantastic drummer, but I don't think she was the one playing that, that beat. That was a computer. I don't think this track has any deeper meaning, and while I don't think this is the track I'd revisit, I was bobbing my head in a pleasant way, so there's that. Yeah, I mean, it is an instrumental, and we do get to hear a little bit of Sheila E's prowess on percussion. I just wish there was more since this is an instrumental, mm -hmm. but we will get a chance a little later in our show. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, if you listen closely to what Prince is doing... It sounds like he's just doing like background vocalizing along to Jesse Johnson's guitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just all sound. I mean, at first I thought maybe it's like backward masking or something, but it's just mm -hmm. kind of like, like, like uh, scatting, if yeah. you will, scatting along to the guitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's a good instrumental. It's catchy, but you just kind of wish there was a little more of her showing off her her percussion skills. Yeah, and. I think even though some of the ele some of the percussion is electronic, I like to think that she was in charge of making it sound the way it did, programming it, running it, or uh, what have you. Mm -hmm. All right, next song, Noon Rendezvous. I love the effect of the drums in the opening. Now, I always pull up mm. the lyrics when I listen to music from uh, for this show. And you can tell from the spelling that this is a Prince song because he uses the letter U and the number two. So I read it as Prince writing a love letter to Sheila. Prince could... Prince could sing this song himself, I'm sure, don't get me wrong, but Sheila makes it more romantic. Not that Prince couldn't be romantic when he wanted to be, but I'm sure it really meant a lot for him to hear his muse reading his words of devotion. However, while very romantic, this song is classy and a touch filthy. Because <laughs> under... Uh, no, think about it. Yeah, it's true, uh, yeah, it's true. Nice. Underneath the sweetness of Sheila's voice in the music, you feel the presence of Prince just building as he yearns to ravish this woman. And you get the sense that they do make love by the end of the song because they move farther and farther and farther away until we can't hear them anymore because they don't want us to hear what's coming next. And it sounds like it'll be a very passionate night if you write so eloquently and she sings so passionately. I hope they had a good time. Yeah, because then at the end you hear that dum, 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 and the fade out. Could be the heartbeats. Or it could be them other. walking up the stairs. That's that's quite some that's some foot stomping. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, maybe they're running up the stairs. Yeah, so this was written by both Sheila and Prince, so uh, probably during their hot and heavy days. Yeah. For me, this is seductive AF. Yeah. Yep. This song sends me to my happy place where you must be eighteen or over. <laughs> Oh, God. I'm your kid, damn it. I'm 21, but jeez. Well, you know, I try to treat you as an adult. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's still weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, what more can I say? Oh, oh, I know, I know. This is probably a case of me overthinking this, but how many of us have time for a noon rendezvous? Not Cause in, many. Because in the real world, world, most of us have to be working during the day, mm -hmm. and noon time comes, and you got 30 minutes to eat, and maybe relax just be f before getting back to the grind. No, but even... Like even if you get an hour, you still have to meet the person, get to the motel or wherever, yeah. do the deed, and get back to work on, on time. time. yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, okay, there's the weekend, but go time could be any time on the weekends. Yeah. And maybe, like I said, I'm probably put too much thought into this. Maybe they both work the night shift, so that time during the day, when they're not sleeping... Uh, I could, yeah, I can, I can respect that. I don't know. Maybe that's one of the benefits of being rich and famous, like Prince. It's like, well, I'm bored. Take your top off, honey. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, that's that's a very good point. Yeah. Um. Oh, something else I was gonna say about this. Is um, the Rhode Island connection, or is that? Later? No, 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 no. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I definitely like the song arrangement. It definitely fits with the words. It definitely has that Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. All right, next song, Oliver's House. Now, first, my first note, that's a hell of a nickname to have, the neighborhood slut. Something tells me Claudine wears that title like a badge of honor because somebody had to be the slut, and it's her. The premise of the song is Sheila lives in a neighborhood where there's this rich, this rich white songwriter named Oliver who's a philanderer and a bit of a weirdo, but he's leaving town so all the girls come over for one last party to have some fun. 
The part that got me um a bit worried is when she talks about Oliver's mother's clothes and how he's a bit strange. And I thought we were going to have a Norman Bates moment. But the uncomfortableness quickly subsides when Sheila talks about the chord Oliver can play. However, some of that musical dissonance later comes back to remind us there's still something off about this man. This song kind of gives me the vibes of the dark underbelly of Hollywood. Like, think Harvey Weinstein, where people kind of knew he was a creep and still wanted to make movies with him, so they tolerated him until all the stuff came about, out about him with the hashtag MeToo movement. I don't think the character of Oliver is as rotten as Weinstein, but something about Oliver here is off. The song is fine, but it drags like hell when Sheila starts singing fun over and over and over for the remaining two minutes. I am of the belief that she could have wrapped up this song with a nice red bow if she did that thing where songs in the 70s would repeat the chorus as the music slowly fades out and then it stops. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't do that here, and while your head is bobbing, you're thinking, okay, it's, it's got to be over now, right? I may have had fun for a little bit, but the party is really winding down, and I want to go home and go to bed. That's enough fun for one track. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this would have been the first song on side two, mm -hmm. on the vinyl, mm -hmm. and it was written by Sheila. And I've always thought that this song has to be about Prince. Yeah. Oliver is so weird, but he knows how to play guitar. Yeah. And for me, it's always been a fun song and clever lines like, we took turns throwing down, we took turns throwing up. Yeah. And I, like I always like that one about um, um, last June, Oliver uh, threw a party for his girl Louise. She got drunk and called me a bitch just because I kissed him. Yeah. That always cracks me up for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> um, and... The thing about this is, like, sometimes Sheila's vocals are hard to hear because there's, like, so much going on. Yeah, you I really have to. That. I mean, this is even with headphones. It's like mm -hmm. I'm straining to hear what, what she's saying. Mm -hmm. And like you, I lost track of how many times she says fun during that last two and a half plus minutes. I didn't even count when I was reading the lyrics. And I th think, like, that last section was for her, like, you hear a little of the timbales and her soloing. Again, not as much as I'd like, but mm -hmm. it's there. Yeah, it's it's there, but not there enough. But, yeah, uh, other than that fun two minutes, great song. Could definitely have used an edit. Right. Yes. Next song. Next time, wipe the lipstick off your collar. And my first note when I read the title was, Bet you five bucks this is an adultery song. However, I can't be sure. The message seems to be Sheila saying to the person she loves, listen, you don't have to put on airs for me, just put in some effort. Like, we can do the simple things like get hamburgers and you don't have to send flowers every day because those are just gestures. I just want to know that your feelings for me are as sincere as my feelings are for you. What pushes me into the belief that this is about adultery, though, like leaning towards the adultery side, is when Sheila tells the person... They don't have to shout, and she knows they're lying. Just don't make it so obvious that you'll embarrass me in front of other people. So it sounds as if this was a friends with benefits situation, but Sheila has taken it to the next stage, and her partner still hasn't gotten with the program yet. They haven't picked up the signs that this is serious and commitment is expected of them. However, hearing Sheila saying this, I think I'd be pretty motivated to turn this ship around for her. So let's <laughs> hope this person pulls themselves together and becomes the better partner she needs them to be. I've always thought this song strike struck the right balance of being hilarious and yet heartfelt mm -hmm. for some of the lines. Um, and the thing is, this song is percussionless, and the arrangement it is. the just arrangement strings. sounds overblown, but in a good way, like very melodramatic. Yeah, I mean, the way it just rushes in with those strings, mm -hmm. and it's just so over the top. Mm -hmm. And for me, I looked at it as like she lives with a no good who runs around on her, and for some reason she accepts this. Like she says, you know. I don't care if you stay out until the break of dawn, but next time, just wipe the lipstick off your collar. Like, like, don't, like, it's weird. It's like, don't embarrass me, but it's kind of like, well, if you know he's running around, why are you still? Maybe they're polyamorous, guy? but she's not okay with it. Yeah, it could be. Maybe this is, ooh, maybe this is a message to Prince. Because he was seeing Susanna at the same time. Mm. 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 Could be. Mm. And, um, you know, like you said, you know, she's telling them that they don't have to go all out. You know, we don't have to eat too fancy. Hamburgers are cool. Mm. Mm. Hey, you had a hamburger Burger. last night. Oh, that was so good. We got oh. Wendy's last night. We hadn't had Wendy's in a while. And she Hashtag does... not sponsored. And she does get in some good singers, particularly blame not blame our sex on your rundown battery. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's because you used it up all on what's her name over there. Yeah. Now, okay, we're going to take time out for a very quick side trip. Okay, let's go on this journey. Okay, because there's actually Rhode Island connection with this song. Now, as 
As you may or may not know out there, this podcast comes to you from a basement somewhere in Rumford, Rhode Island. Yeah, we're not saying where, though. We're not getting any stalkers coming to our house. But they do know we live in Rumford. Uh, but move. there are there are a lot of houses. Yeah, moving and, on. Anyway, anyway. Yep. Also from Rhode Island is Lipstick's co-writer and vocal co-vocalist Brenda Bennett. Uh, Hi, Brenda. Brenda Masha or Moshe, I'm sorry, I don't know which one it is to pronounce. I uh, was born in Warwick, Rhode Island, 1952. Seeing a short film of the Beatles on The Tonight Show with Jack Parr on January 3rd, 1964, was a huge, huge influence on her. And yes, that was one month before they were on Ed Sullivan. Wow. Uh, another life-changing experience for her was when she saw Bonnie Ray at play at Brown in 1968. Mm-hmm. Bonnie was a woman with a Stratocaster not playing folk music. She was playing blues. She had an electric guitar. She also did slide guitar. And this was like unheard of mm-hmm. at that time. Uh, Brenda went on to sing with the legendary Ken Lyon and Tombstone. And she then went on to hit the cover band circuit, which she got sick of and pondered what to do next. Mm-hmm. She met lighting designer Roy Bennett, who was working on Prince's Dirty Mind tour. Brenda and Roy married in 1981. Oh. Would later divorce. Oh, Sorry. Um, she went out with Roy on Prince's Controversy Tour, and to justify her presence of being on that tour, uh, she wound up working four jobs, two on the crew and two for Prince. Oh, crew's nice. As wardrobe mistress and videographer. Like, she would take videos of him in, in performance because what he would do is he would break down his shows to see what needed ch- what needed change, mm-hmm. which give him a lot of credit for doing that. Um, in January of 82, Prince discovered that Brenda could sing when he heard her singing along to a rough mix of Stevie Nicks' Stand Back. Now, Stevie had sent the rough mix to Prince because she wanted to have him make some sort of contribution to the song. Mm-hmm. Like, she sent it to him for voice, which he did. He he put on this memorable two-note keyboard riff that is very dominant through the song. Mm-hmm. Anyway... Um, Prince had this concept for a girl group. He was originally set to call the Hookers. Oh, God. Eventually, he changed to Vanity Six, um, which was made up of Brenda, who was the cigarette-smoking bad girl, Susie Moonsey, and Denise Matthews, Mm -hmm. also known as Vanity. And the way that she got uh, the name Vanity was Prince looked at her and thought he was seeing a female version of himself, which I guess he thought was quite vain, and thought, okay, vanity. Uh Um, They had a number one dance hit with the song Nasty Girl, Mm -hmm. and they were one of the opening acts on the 1999 tour. Uh, Vanity 6 eventually became Apollonia 6 when Vanity left for Motown in 1983. Mm -hmm. And Apollonia 6, Ellie and Brenda, are in the movie Purple Rain. Mm -hmm. Uh, Since then, Brenda has kept on keeping on, and in 2015, she was inducted into the Ron Music Hall of Fame, which is in Pawtucket, or Pawtucket, as we natives say. Yeah, Pawtucket. Uh, Wikipedia says she currently lives in Jamestown, Rhode Island. And for a more comprehensive Brenda bio, uh, check out the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame's website because it is just so detailed. And I just had to, like, cherry pick here and there for mm-hmm. for our podcast. Yeah. And, okay, where were we? Uh, the Glamorous oh, Life. Oh, The Glamorous Life, yes. All right. Let's. Let's wrap this up. All right, The Glamorous mm. Life. I have a crazy theory. Go ahead. This song is Sheila E.'s version of Sophisticated Lady. Okay. All Explain. Right. A woman has all the material things in life and appears to have it all, but under the surface there's something missing because she hasn't found a man to love. Oh, my God. I could agree with that because Sophisticated Lady came on my iPod three times in a row yesterday, so I can definitely see that. The James Darren one, too? And Rosemary Clooney and uh, No, um, from um, Duke Ellington Live at Newport in 1956. Alright, so, as Sheila says, without love, the glamorous life is much. The glamorous life is also looking for love in the wrong places with her one-night stands. I think one problem is that she likes to dominate men in bed, but the thing is her sexual type may not be the type of man who she would find fulfillment in. And what's uh, scaring the glamorous woman is that she knows this isn't enough, but she can't seem to find a person to break the cycle. So she continues this image of having it all. This is the definition of sophistry. Concerned with appearances, nothing of substance underneath. 
Or in this case, what is underneath is a despairing basket case. Also, I know Prince wrote a lot of the songs on here, but this is one of the ones where you can really tell he wrote it, and not just because he sings on it. I also think this song he could have sung easily as opposed to Noon, Ron Noon Rendezvous. And finally, with the song, we get a little bit of Sheila drumming where it really stands out. And what can I say? She's a badass drummer. And yet, while she sounds great, do we really need nine minutes? I mean, she's Sheila, so she can go off on those drums as long as the hell she wants. And maybe Prince wanted to show off what his girlfriend can do with the drumsticks, but man, it gets to be quite a bit after a while. So I'd say to our listeners, if you wanted to pause this song or turn it off before it's finished, I understand where you're coming from, and just know it's okay. You're playing the music, so you can control what you do and don't want to hear. Your music, your car, your rules. Okay, it's the last song and the first big hit. Mm -hmm. And like you said, say so yeah, the poor little rich girl. She wants stuffs, but what she really needs is love. Mm -hmm. But love is scary, and it's kind of big, and you're making a commitment, and... Where's my stuff? Just make with the diamond, the diamonds and furs, and nobody gets hurt. Yeah. Uh, if I gave you diamonds and furs. Doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> great groove, great sax from Larry Williams. And yeah, Sheila finally gets to stretch out instrumentally for the last four minutes of the song. And yes, it is nine minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never found the song that long or boring. I mean, it's longer than Oliver's House. And mm -hmm. that last two minutes of Oliver's drives me more nuts. Huh. Not to say that the glamorous life drives me nuts. It doesn't. But mm -hmm. it, it's never seemed as long as it, as it is. That's what she said. <laughs> um, and if you want an edited version, check out the video where she hits the cymbal with a high kick in high heels, <gasps> scattering glitter everywhere that was on top of the cymbal. Very impressive. Damn, I might get hot. <laughs> but, but yeah, catchy song. Um, great video. It's a little gets a little freaky deaky with some black and white stuff with these people wandering the streets and like this uh, masquerade masquerade ball costumes. Like we're about to do something nasty. <laughs> um, but yeah, always love this song. And um, that is it. The glamorous life just has six songs, All which right. I consider an EP. That's fair. Okay. Okay. Kind of like this episode probably is. Yeah, this is our version of an EP because normally our episodes like go over an hour. How like, long are we into now? Thirty-two minutes. Wow. Okay. All right. So overall, this album is okay. I was kind of expecting to have this big moment where all of a sudden Sheila's music kicked in for me and I finally got it, but I'm sad to say that I did not have that moment and I wish I did. And I even typed in a little frowny, sad face just so you knew I was sad. Oh yeah. Yeah. It always sucks when I come into this show really wanting to love something and then I don't. I think I do like Sheila in small doses, though, and especially when she's drumming because she just murders those drum kits. Again, if you haven't seen her play for Carlos Santana at the Kennedy Center Honors where she just does her drum solo and she pushes over the cymbals, watch it. It's great. However, I don't think I could do a whole album. So if you play her in the car for fun, I might jam along, but it won't be for too long. I want to apologize for feeling this way, though. This is our show, and unfortunately her music didn't grab me the way I hoped it would. Hmm. Sorry. Well, I kind of have a different take where overall it's a good, solid album. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, EP. Yes, it's an EP, six <laughs> songs, a little over half an hour. Yep. It gets EP status. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, yeah, there's really not one bad track. Just the whole fun, fun, fun thing at the end of Oliver's. That's kind of the only downer moment for me. Um, I think I'm probably going to check out her latest stuff because I'd like to think maybe after she got out from under Prince's influence, she had more control of how she wanted her music to sound mm -hmm. and maybe she got to stretch out more. So I'm going to, I'm going to check out her other stuff and see what's there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like I said, check out the glamorous life video. Cause you get to see, you know, she's playing the timbales through the whole song and she does a great job. She does these spins, does not miss a beat, throws the drumsticks in the air. And yep. again, the high heel, high cymbal kick. It's just flat out impressive. And that is, basically it all right thank you for listening to another episode of my dad listens to this if you like this episode please give it a like if you didn't like it too bad we're gonna make more and it's probably gonna be a longer episode yeah so you'll have to suffer um if you have any specific thoughts leave a comment down below subscribe if you want to know when our videos are coming out tap the bell if you want to be notified immediately uh follow me on facebook twitter tumblr instagram if you want to know when our episodes are coming out or if you're friends with my dad i can have him email the episodes right into your inbox and it'll feel special and nice because it's coming directly from him. 
Right. All right. As always, thank you for listening to another installment of My Dad Listens to This. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Anything you want to say, Dad, before we log off? Thank you, and hey, live the glamorous life, gang. Yep. Oh, and, um... Good luck with, you know, the way things are these days. Yeah. But, um, also, if you're wearing heels, try not to hurt yourself. Yes. Goodbye.